Dubai is a tiny sheikdom nestled along the Persian Gulf on the eastern edge of the Arabian Peninsula and part of a tiny oil-rich country called the United Arab Emirates. Over the course of just a few decades, it's transformed itself from a spit of sand about the size of Rhode Island into the Singapore of the Middle East. It's a political, economic, and financial success story in a region torn by conflict. And as we first reported last October, it's all the vision of one man, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. He rarely gives interviews, but you're about to meet him and get his tour of one of the fastest growing places on earth. No matter how many articles you read or how many pictures you see, they don't quite capture the enormity and the energy of Dubai. It is a physical manifestation of Arab oil wealth set in concrete, glass, and steel. A place so rich and ambitious that it is changing the geography of the world as a business center, transportation hub, and tourist destination. A 21st century city at the crossroads of a new world. Skyscrapers rise in clusters, man-made islands rise from the sea, and entire neighborhoods with hundreds of office buildings and apartments rise from the sand. And it is all the vision of one man, Sheikh Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum. This is where we're standing now. All oh, this is nothing. 2000, 2000, 2000. January 2000. Seven what, years what, ago. Yes, this was desert. And look now, all what you see. What you see has been called the largest construction site on earth, with a half a million laborers working on a reported three hundred billion dollars worth of projects building Sheikh Muhammad's dream of a modern, efficient, and tolerant Arab city with fine restaurants and a vibrant nightlife, both the playground and the business capital of a new Middle East. What are you trying to do here? What do you want this place to be? I want it to be number one. Not in the region, but in the world. What do you mean number one in the world? In everything. High education, health, uh, housing, just making my people the highest way of living. At 59 years old, he is one of the richest people in the world, a member of the Maktoum family, which has ruled here for nearly two centuries. He's a former Air Force pilot and an avid horseman who competes in cross-country endurance races and is one of the largest breeders of thoroughbred racehorses in the world. By Western standards, his marital situation is a little complicated. He's married to Princess Haya, the daughter of the late King Hussein of Jordan, but he also has another wife who is rarely seen in public. He is frequently described as a workaholic, and as we found one morning, always in motion. I'm just doing my normal thing, which is, you know... You like to stay on your feet? Yeah. <laughs> Where's your security detail? I don't have a security. You just walk yes. around by yourself? Yeah. He's famous for dropping in unannounced at construction sites and government offices to see how things are going. We'll get in this car, huh? This is my car. All right, fine. I will drive. Okay. He uses his cars, his mobile offices. So you travel by yourself all the time? Most of the time I travel by myself, yes. It seemed like almost everyone in Dubai knew the car and who was driving. Uh, yeah, done. But you see, the whole area is going, uh, growing here. There is a little bit of Donald Trump in it, at least when it comes to showmanship. You know this building up there? That strange-looking building on the left is one of the world's tallest indoor ski slopes. Outside, it may be 120, but inside, it feels like the Alps. And they are set and ready to run. Then there is the Dubai World Cup, showcasing the fastest horses in the world running for the world's largest purse. Not to mention the most luxurious and expensive hotel in the world, the Burj Al Arab, where the cheapest room is $2,000 a night. Why do you want everything to be the biggest, the tallest? Steve, why not? Why not? If you can have it in New York, what can we have it here? Why are you in such a hurry? Most people would try and do all of this in a lifetime, not in five years. I want, I want my people to live better life now, to go to the high school now, to go to the good uh, health care now, not after 20 years. His people, the descendants of Bedouin tribesmen, pearl divers and traders, now make up a small fraction of the population here. 
they enjoy one of the highest standards of living in the world, with free health care and college tuition and no taxes. Business consultants told him the project was unfeasible, but with no environmental regulations to stop him, Sultan began dredging a hundred million cubic yards of sand from the Persian Gulf, along with seven million tons of rock to form a man-made island in the shape of a palm. It more than doubled the coastline of Dubai and created waterfront condos and homes for 150,000 people, not including 35 hotels. Most people, if they brought in a business consultant and they told them this is a terrible idea, it's not going to work, they wouldn't do it. Most people, yes, but not us. What's the country's reputation in the rest of the Arab world? Remember, we have 300 million people live in this region. 86% of the youth being questioned, they say they want to come to Dubai. Their destination number one is not London, it's not New York, as used to be in the old days, or France, it is Dubai. Most people, if they brought in a business consultant and they told them this is a terrible idea, it's not going to work, they wouldn't do it. Most people, yes, but not us. You remember a number of months ago, the World Bank and the IMF, oh, come on now, you've got to pick some buzzwords out. These are so important to your life and to your dinner table, you can't imagine it. You remember about three, four months ago, the World Bank and the IMF said, oh, and they made themselves look so good. They said, we're going to forgive the loans of every third world country and every nation, every third world nation in the world. We're going to forgive their loans. Oh, didn't they look like such benevolent people? No, not on your life. First thing I thought in my mind was, come on now, nobody forgives a loan unless somebody pays for it. They weren't doing you a favor. You know who paid off the, third, the loans of every third world country? You know who paid them off? You did. And you did. And you did, and I did. Where? At the gas pump. You don't know this. I would have never known it had I not sat in their board meetings, had I not rubbed shoulders with them, sat across the dinner table from them. Most authors would have given anything to be able to even rub shoulders with these people one time. I lived with them for three years. I don't have to research somebody else's material and write a book. I wrote a book from what I lived for three years' time, and I'm here to tell you so you can save your family and your dinner table, and we can help turn America around. <laughs> Who are they? Saudi Arabia, any oil-producing country of the world. They sell their oil to the men who sit behind the computers in New York and London every day and they're representatives of the World Bank and the IMF and they're the ones that make the difference between what Saudi Arabia gets a barrel of oil out of the ground. You know how much Saudi Arabia, how much it costs them to get a barrel of oil out of the ground? It costs them five dollars. Who's making that between that and seventy dollars a barrel? They sell it to the oil bourse. Their representatives sit behind the computers in New York and London. They tell everybody on the face of the earth what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil for that day. OPEC has nothing to do with it. Shell Oil Company has nothing to do with it. You don't have anything to do with it. Price and demand has nothing to do with it. It's controlled by the men who sit behind the computers in New York and London every day. They're representatives of the World Bank and the IMF, and they take the big cut right off the top before the oil company ever gets theirs, and they could forgive the loans of every third world country because you paid for it at the gas pump and it's an atrocity and if the world ever wakes up they're going to overthrow the powers that be and the people will be we the people again and now they have established something called a cartel like a monopoly a monopoly means you take control of the market and you fix the price. So no competition anymore in the market. This is haram. Even in American law, this is haram. <laughs> yeah. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa I hope Bank Negara is listening. 
A man came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and said, O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Impose price control. He said, no. The man came back a second time. The man came back a third time. Three times. O Messenger of Allah, impose price control. Fix the price. The Prophet said, no. Not in our market. Not in the market of Islam. There is no such thing as price control. There is no such thing as fixed wages. There is no such thing as a minimum wage. I hope the Malaysian government is listening. Not in Islam. Islam gives to the world a free market and a fair market. And the market determines prices. No, you cannot say Tetarik, this price, and put it up on the wall there. That's haram. Tetarik will be sold on the basis of the market price. Roti Chennai, this much. Haram. I wonder whether the muftis know that. So there is no such thing as monopoly in our Islamic market. There is no such thing as a cartel. You cannot fix prices. You cannot control the market as producers. Which is what OPEC has done. This is not Islam. No. Has any scholar, Salafi or Sufi, eh, denounced OPEC for violating Allah's law and the Sunnah of the Prophet? I'm not aware of it. And so now you have a controlled market. And forget it. The price of oil is no longer determined by the free and fair market. Forget that. The price of oil is now manipulated by those who control the market. And what they did with oil, they did with cocoa, they did with coffee, they did with sugar, they did with rice, they did with all commodities. They manipulate the market and they fix the price. It's no longer a free and a fair market anywhere in the world. It's a Zionist market of thieves. Is this what the Jewish religion gave you to the world? Not at all. You have corrupted the Jewish religion and you're destroying the Jewish religion. According to a latest study on the 2011 Somali famine, the country's UN humanitarian coordinator Felipe Lazzarini announced that more than a quarter of a million people died in the famine, with half of them being children under the age of five. Lazzarini also said that humanitarian and donors must be prepared to act as soon as early evidence shows a deteriorating situation and not wait until famine is officially declared. I mean, the shocking, I mean, figures, uh, we talk about 258,000 people who died during a period of 18 months. Half of them, 130,000, were children under five. Now, Save the Children, a leading independent organization for children in need, warns that the humanitarian situation for children in the country remains extremely serious. It says that despite an improvement in food security, children continue to die because they don't have enough to eat. It also says that governments, donors, the UN and NGOs need to change their approach to chronic drought situations by managing the risks, not the crisis.